it was a time of tremendous and terrible persecution of the church. The year is 300 AD, and Emperor Diocletian has made a name for himself, murdering and exiling Christians, the seemingly unconquerable virus of his empire as he saw it. Few Roman emperors are as true to the Roman gods as is our Diocletian. He stops at nothing to wipe the superstition from the face of the earth. <laughs> Christianity. <laughs> and good riddance too. They are atheists, you know. They deserve all they get for denying our Roman gods. I dare say they deserve to die. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yes. yes. My gentle nephew, Lysimachus, why so dour in the corner? Come, have a drink with us. Stop your womanly scribblings and come carouse like a man. <laughs> Fairer than any flower. No daughter of any king can compare. No, no, no daughter of goddess Venus herself compares. Oh, oh beautiful angel Fibronia. Fibronia, how is it that I can think of nothing but you? Lysimachus! Coming, uncle. Fibronia, if I asked for your delicate hand. Nephew, I can see you're writing more love poems to Fibinia. Fibronia. Well, you certainly have set your sights high, my boy. She's a beauty indeed. Fibinia has the attention of many a suitors, or so is all the talk. Febronia. Little did Lysimachus know that Silenius himself harbored ill imaginings. Let me see if I can talk to your father for you. He's no senator like Febinia's father, but your father is still of high rank. A nobleman. Perhaps we can get something arranged. Febronia. Though Lysimachus was a pagan and had no interest in the Christian faith, he saw in Febronia not mere physical beauty, but a beauty of soul, a grace and humility that he thought came only from Febronia's heart or personality, something that he never witnessed in the pagan women of his society, flaunting and petty. Little did Lysimachus know that Febronia's chief beauty flowed from her faith a life dedicated to denying herself and serving God above all. Your sisters can't help but be jealous, dear Febronia. They stopped even acting excited when a young man comes calling to our home. They know whichever boy it is. He's here to see you. I don't wish that any would come calling, Mother. Fabronia, under her robes, moved a small prayer rope, saying to herself over and over, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. That is, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. You and Lysimachus seem to get along quite well. He's a good friend. He's nice, yes, and kind. He's nice, he's kind. My dear daughter, sometimes that's all a woman can hope for in marriage. Your only alternative is to go live out in the desert with those nuns. What my sister was thinking, I'll never know. Anyway, I know you don't want that. What a waste of your beauty that would be. Christ Jesus, you know my heart, you know my fears. Help me to do your will. Give me courage. Show me your path for me. I know you have not called me to a marriage with a non-believing man, but I see no other options before me. Fabronia, is that a tear in your eye? Come now, my daughter. If you knew how many young women weep for wanting your beauty, you'd never cry again. Come, don't stain that gorgeous face with tears. Lysimachus is coming by today with an announcement. Uh, an announcement? Kitty Elison. Mm-hmm. You know he's the son of a nobleman. Very wealthy. 
Lysimachus arrives some time later, and after pleasantries with the family, now walks with Febronia in the courtyard. Lysimachus has been fumbling some small papyrus sheets in his hand. He seems rather nervous. Feb... Febronia, I... I... May the prayers of the Virgin Mary be with me. I... I... I, I don't know how to say... What to say, I... Uh, you are... I mean... I have never seen a woman as captivating as you. I love you, Febronia, with all my heart. Oh... daughter will make such a pair. Whether anyone noticed or not, Fabronia, feeling dizzy and utterly confused, sits down, praying in a whisper. God help me, God help me, God help me. Whether it was in this moment, history may never know. Fabronia decided to leave the comforts of her home life, to give it all up, to flee in the night, leaving into the east, the decision that would forever change her life. That night, when all the house was sleeping, Fabronia gathered all of her things that she could carry for a long travel, taking what money she may need and little else, and left her home, never to return. Please, sir, pass this shoe with Syria. Why do you cover your face so? Sir, please, just pass this shoe with Syria. How many arduous days and chilly nights, the long weeks or even months it took Febronia to travel, this story does not tell. But at last she arrived in Nisibis at the convent of Abbas Braina, Febronia's aunt, her mother's sister. Dear Fabronia, Lord, hear our prayer. My sister's daughter? What brings you? What has happened? I will not marry another. I will not be betrothed. I have given my life to Christ, and I will have no other. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I will have no other but Christ. Some weeks later, back in the capital of the empire, Rome, the little was known, it slowly became apparent over the weeks that followed that Fabronia had traveled into the east. Laura, having her suspicions that her daughter fell ill along the lines of her sister Brianna, kept it to herself so as to not draw any negative attention to her family. I will seek an assignment in the east. Perhaps my uncle can help arrange an audience with the emperor. The story of the strange disappearance of the most beautiful maiden in the land caused a stir in the community, and through these rumors and gossiping, word that Fabronia may have held to the Christian faith began to emerge, even reaching the ears of the Emperor Diocletian. Without telling Lysimachus, Silenus did in fact arrange an audience with the Emperor, but it was of a very different nature. Domine meus, Imperator Diocletianus, my lord, I wish to go and take the fled beauty as my own. If you so allow it, I will do your will on my travels, whatever they may be. I have allowed the assignment of your nephew to travel into the east. He was fond of that young woman, I dare say, too fond. Many say she was of that Jesus superstition which makes me think he was too. All too possible, my lord. I grant you license to go and take her back, Silenus, but the prize for her will be that along the way you will drive out and wipe out any trace of Christians you come across. 
Yes, my lord. History will remember and celebrate their annihilation. For too long have we tolerated their religion. This very day I have issued an edict recalling all protections once given to Christians. From this day forward, all Christians are enemies of the Empire. I want that virus eradicated. You will be escorted by a squadron of my troops. Use them effectively. It will be done as you say, Domine Meus. Of course I will pray for your goat's milk this spring. And yes, please, may I purchase this bag of figs for the convent? Please, this is free of charge today. No, 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 I will pay, I insist. God bless you, brother. In this convent, they adhered to the rule that every Friday be spent only in prayer and the reading of the sacred books without any other type of work. I see that when Febronia reads... Far too many sisters and visitors are distracted and captivated by the beauty of her face. Thus, from that point forward, Brianna had Fibronia read the sacred books to the convent while she was hidden behind a curtain. Silenus began a march of terror at the emperor's orders. Everywhere he went on his way east, he would cunningly seek out Christians, and once found, he'd have them executed on the spot. Be sure you ask them all if you have seen one Febronia. Any word of her, bring her to me at once. Kill the Christians otherwise! As Silenus marched on eastward, he thought that his efforts were succeeding for he was finding fewer and fewer Christians each town he entered. Lysimachus, having heard of his uncle's mission against the Christians, had begun bravely seeking out the Christians first, warning them to flee, or at least hide. Many times Lysimachus bravely hid Christians right under the nose of his very own uncle. What? Who are you? Listen to me quickly. I come in peace, but others soon come behind me who do not. What, what, what are you talking about? Please leave everything behind. Flee to the mountains now. Flee to the hills. What about our family? Tell only your closest family whom you trust. Now go. Your lives are in danger. Why shouldn't we listen to you? My uncle leads a squadron of imperial troops. The March of Terror. Yes, the ones you've heard about. They are killing Christians wantonly. Please go. Take your family now. Get the children now. Halt here, men. We're here to search these premises. I've searched all through here. There aren't any Christians here. None. You can move on. And so it was that Lysimachus protected many Christians against the diabolical plot to exterminate them, even at the hand of his very uncle. In the year 310, as the providence of God would have it, Silenus's march of terror came to the town of Nisibis. Captain Silenus, we have received word that there is a certain nun in this town who reads from behind a curtain because of how beautiful she is. That must be her. That must be Febronia. Bring her to me. Febronia refused to be brought before Silenus. So Silenus went to her and getting past the brave Brianna. Your swords may cut and kill here, but the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will come and judge all. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Silenus found Febronia in the quiet of her cell, and he interrogated her. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. My, you are a pretty thing, aren't you? Even with your crazy mumblings. The beauty who ran away from the choice of any man she desired, who fled wealth and honor to come live like this. <laughs> I've come to set you free. I don't know what you've heard about my travels here, about the edict, but it should not affect you. No, not you. 
I am not here to hurt you, Febronia. I am here to save you. Jesus the Christ is my savior. Beautiful, but foolish. You have a choice before you, pretty thing. One, denounce this Jesus, and I will let you live. And I will even let you marry my nephew. Simply denounce this Christ as a lie before the emperor. The devil is a liar. Yet every word that proceeds from Christ is life. Or two, marry me, Febronia. I'll take you away from here. I will not hurt you. Marry me. As long as you never speak of it and it remains only in your mind, believe anything, any superstition you want. But marry me. I will not enter into marriage with a mortal man. Then you have chosen death. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What? Where am I? What is happening? You have failed us, Silenus, you useless vessel! Silenus, in a demonic fit, slammed his head against a marble pillar and fell to death. Hours too late, Lysimachus arrives to find the convent empty. Most of the nuns had fled after the death of Silenus, only to come back once they knew that it was safe. Lysimachus, looking upon the corpse of the woman he loved, had his heart softened. He ordered that Fabronia's body be honorably buried at the convent. He and many other soldiers gave their life to Christ and were baptized that day. Holy Martyr Fabronia, pray to God for us. Nick, one thing that struck me, you know, recording this episode is we live in a culture that's so focused on outward beauty. And St. Fabronia, as you know, we listening to this episode, she was very, very beautiful. And yet her beauty was founded in her faith, in her chastity, in her meekness. Yeah, you know, that really did stand out to me too. I was thinking with today's culture or anti-culture of the media that is just so obsessed with externals, right? The external, the outside of the cup, as Christ calls it. Is there space for the good seed to land on the soil of someone that would be blessed with exterior beauty? You know, it's such a temptation then, but also it's a temptation now. I think social media and media in general really aggravates that, unfortunately. I was I was thinking that same thing while we were recording and listening and hearing this story and learning of this amazing saint and this amazing martyr and her witness. Absolutely. And, and you know, to see that this is a, a young woman who, at any moment, Nick, she you could imagine the pressures that were on her. She could have easily married probably a wealthy nobleman and lived a casual, comfortable life. But instead, you know, by God's grace, she had this deep devo- devotion and faith in God that she was willing to forego all those things. She saw through that thin veneer of beauty. What does the Bible say? Beauty is fleeting, mm. but a woman who loves the Lord mm. is to be revered, mm. right? It seems like that this is a theme that we keep on going back to, the option of a comfortable life, right? Or choosing the hard path, right? That St. Anthony chose. He was yes. a very rich man, you know? I don't know. There are no descriptions that I've heard that he was handsome, but maybe he could have easily found wives for him to marry. I'm sure, you know, with with money like this, he could find himself in society very easily. St. Peter the Merciful. St. Peter the Merciful, exactly. All these people, whether it's money, power, influence, prestige, you know, whether it's through the military, like St. Nikon, but all these people, whatever they're given by God, they give it back. 
right? And that's, it's kind of, that's the hard thing, right? That's why we tie. That's why we try to give whatever talents it is, whether it's our money, whether it's whatever literally talents, you know. You reminded me, Nick, of the idea <laughs> that uh, another Bible verse, to whom much is given, much is expected in return. And and here this, you know, this woman, St. Fabronia, she was born, you could call it a gift, right? She was born very, very beautiful. And, and yet she used that for God's glory. She used it for God's kingdom. Not only does she sanctify herself, but she inspires even her suitor, right? Yes. Her, her prospective suitor. She brings him to the faith. I love this, Nick. I'm so glad you brought this up. Lysimachus. Yeah. Lysimachus. Cause, and, and I love, Nick, this is such a powerful story. And I'm so glad that you listening right now were able to hear this episode. Because Lysimachus, you may think, I thought, when you read it in the beginning, you think, well, this Lysimachus is going to probably turn out to be a jerk. <laughs> it's probably going to turn out, you know, whatever. He just wants to marry her, mm -hmm. right? But in the end, as you said, Nick, her faith, her devotion, his witness of that changed his life. Yeah, it's so amazing, so amazing that that these things can happen providentially. You never know, you know, if God is calling us to be witnesses, we don't know what our witness, if we're faithful to what God is calling us to do, how it can reach people, even if it's people we don't want to be around, right? She didn't want to be married to him, but even through her literal martyrdom from his uncle who had ill intentions, yes. right, for her and all Christians— through all this, she was able to bring his nephew, Lysimachus, to repentance and brought him to the faith. Her perseverance changed his heart, right? Softened his heart, absolutely. You know, you brought up Silenus, the, the uncle who was unrepentant and a di you know, degenerate, um, it seems. And, you know, that we talked, Nick, a little bit about, you know, this was under Diocletian, and he was renowned or I should say maybe infamous uh, and notorious for being one of the most brutal uh, of the emperors um, of that time period. And this Silenus was using that to come not only just to kill Christians, but also in this mad chase after St. Fabronia. Yes, very, very strange, unfortunately. And his ending is very, very more than strange. It's very sad to see what can happen if you open the doors to yes. the demons in the way that he did yes. through torturing Christians and through basically living the life of the old man, right? And and, and allowing Satan to live in him. So what this was, this what we call in our episode, uh, the this march of, of terror, is there had been some protections of Christians that were kind of put into place in certain areas in the in the empire this what we saw in this episode diocletian pulled back some of those protections he said no no more i'm getting rid of those protections and open the floodgates again for persecutions you know nick this is a story that that speaks for itself in many ways um and so we just want to thank our listeners for for listening this long um if you are interested in more Cloud of Witnesses Journey with the Saints episodes, Nick, where can they find us? If you Google us, if you Google Cloud of Witnesses Journey with the Saints or Cloud of Witnesses Radio, you are bound to find us on one of our many and several platforms. Yeah. And just so you know, those of you, we are working on getting out to more platforms as well over time. We are really excited about our Instagram account. Please come over there. Give us a follow. Uh, Look, check out our content. Um, we're just very excited and very blessed to be able to bring this content to you. And so we thank you for being there. We're also on Facebook. Like Jeremy said, please give us a like, subscribe, but also share it. So these stories, God willing, can reach other people and inspire them as well. Amen. We hope that the story of St. Fabronia, her faith, her devotion to Christ was inspiring for you. And please reach out to us. Let us know what you think. Thank you. This is Alexander, and I was one of the narrators and some extras. Hi, this is Tirza, and I was one of the narrators. This is Nick, and I was a soldier. This is Jeremy, and I played a soldier. This is Lev, and I played Emperor Diocletian and some other minor characters. Hi, I'm Julianne, and I played Laura and Brianna. This is John, and I played Silenus. This is Joshua, and I played Lysimachus. This is Hannah, and I played Fabronia. And that's a wrap. 
Guys, was it fun acting today in Cloud of Witnesses? Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Cloud of Witnesses, Journey with the Saints. We hope it proved to be exciting and inspiring for all of our listeners. May God, through the prayers of his most pure mother and all the saints, guide us all to the heavenly homeland. We hope to see you next time here on Cloud of Witnesses, Journey with the Saints.